Today we look at Isaiah chapter 64 verses 1 through 8. It begins the season of Advent as we begin to look forward once to God's grace and his coming in Bethlehem and as he comes again in glory to bring us to heaven. The theme today is God comes to destroy and to save. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We read the first and the last verse of our Old Testament lesson today, and we'll discuss the Lord as our Father and His faithful intervention in history this morning. You, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So far the text today. Isaiah is probably the prophet in whose prophecy exists the greatest amount of gospel. He looks eagerly forward to the servant of the Lord who comes in his first advent and who will come again to judge the nations. We look at Advent itself as we begin the season once again. We look at two Advents, don't we, as we think of this. Our focus is not at Advent on the birth of Christ. That's Christmas. But we do look back. We look back to see all the glorious promises of God and all the remarkable things that God has done throughout human history. Because they inform us about what God is doing today in our lives through the word and the sacrament as he once came in grace at Bethlehem. And as one day he will return in judgment to judge the living and the dead as we confessed in our creed and take us all, his faithful people, home to be with him. So in between, he comes to us faithfully every day. Every day, he makes his home in our hearts. And he does that by his word and the sacraments. We call those the means of grace. For he enters in through the water of holy baptism. And in Christian baptism, we become his own, forgiven children of God. And he keeps us, by the word, walking in that baptism, safe in his care. And as we grow and mature and understand the Lord more and more deeply, we come to the Lord at a certain point in life, here before his altar where he sets before us his rehearsal banner. And we receive in the bread and wine provided the very body and blood of Christ because it forgives our sins. It strengthens our faith. And it keeps us secure unto life everlasting. We live in a world that doesn't really understand those concepts anymore. In fact, the world we live in is very much like the world in Isaiah's time. If you recall the history of the children of Israel, it's a matter of them growing farther and farther from the Lord, and the Lord calling them back through the prophets, as he does in our text today. But Israel, when they gave in to their sin and chose to turn and be away from the Lord, the Lord did not stop them, although he continued to call but he gave them what they wanted. And as they hardened their hearts, just like Pharaoh, God would harden their hearts finally, and they would wallow in the filth and the swill, which were their sins. But God always maintains a faithful remnant. And at some time, just like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable, that son who took half of his father's money and spent it on wild living and finally found himself in the deepest, darkest pit of life, living with the pigs, 
hungry to even eat the indigestible pods that they were feeding. <coughs> Israel would come to its senses and think, what have I done? There is food in my father's house. Even his servants are clothed and eat well. And they would return to their father and say, Father, we are not worthy to be called your child. And in repentance, they would call upon him once again. And the pattern would repeat and repeat and repeat. You can see it plainly if you just simply read the book of Judges. In Isaiah's day, people were wandering far from the Lord. That doesn't mean it wasn't a prosperous society. Everybody was eating well. Everybody was living well. They all had their little gadgets and niceties that made life at home wonderful. They were happy with their families and their children and their businesses and their education and all the wonderful things that Israelite society provided at the time. They seemed to have it all. But they lacked one thing. They were spiritually bankrupt. Their love, their greed for more, for greater, for better, had led them far from the Lord. And the Lord had finally abandoned them and turned them over to the desires of their heart and had eventually had to harden their heart once again and let them sink to the lowest, deepest part of the pit of their life. And here in Isaiah's prayer, he turns to the Lord and he prays to the Father. He prays to the Father as a kind and loving caregiver, like the father in the prodigal, who yearned daily looking for his son, hoping and praying that he would appear. And when he appeared upon the horizon, dropped everything and ran out to greet him. God, our Heavenly Father, does the very same thing with Israel. He wants them to return. <coughs> Isaiah prays throughout his, his prayer today a variety of different things. He starts out by saying, Why, O oh Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of that are your inheritance. And then people of that day, like people of today, wanted everything real, very real. And Isaiah is very real in his prayer and his prophecy to them about where they are in their lives of sin. He calls them dry twigs set afire. He calls them uh, to account that God's judgment is coming. He prays that God will quake the mountains and come down that they might tremble before him. He reviews the ancient ways. He remembers the times of Israel's wandering and how God in ancient times acted in history, intervening to save them. He says in verse 4, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. His heart turns again to God. And he acknowledges the sinfulness of the people. All of us have become like one who's unclean. And our righteous acts like filthy rags. We're all shriveled up like a dry leaf. And like the wind, our sins Sweep us away. Lord, we have nothing within us of any value to you. Even our morally right righteousness, all of our good acts in the eyes of people around us are filthy because of what we have done. They're tainted by sin, O oh Lord. They're tainted by sin. He uses the word unclean. Leviticus 13 who is unclean? Who must call unclean? The lepers. The infectious skin disease that destroys life. He equates them to lepers, spiritual lepers. 
And because of their leprosy of sin, they are dying. We are so unclean, Lord. Our best actions are like filthy rags. But, but, having declared the law of God, having acknowledged his sin before the Lord, he turns to the Lord once again. And he calls upon the Lord to remember them. He says in his last verse, Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. He is their Father, not just their Creator. And we remember when God knelt in the mud and formed Adam from the dirt of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the very breath of life. And Adam became a living being. For God is Adam's creator. But more than simply his creator, Isaiah calls us to remember that God also has established a loving relationship with us. That in every way he is our father. No matter what may overtake us in life. No matter how deeply we may be embroiled or ensnared in, in, in our sins. No matter how far we like sheep have wandered from his good and gracious care. He continues to love you. He continues to love you through it all. And though we wouldn't want to continue to sin against his grace for judgment is coming... We can go back to him and say, Father, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you and heaven. And in his loving relationship, in his faithfulness for us, he will again intervene in our history. He will intervene in your life to forgive your sin. To restore you to that loving and right relationship with him. And having done so. Connects you deeply with his word. And draws you again to his table. To receive in a very meaningful and a very personal. In a very physical way. The forgiveness of sins that was offered to you and to me on the cross of Christ whose hands were pierced for us and opened wide that we might be embraced by him. Isaiah calls upon the Lord to remember. Advent is a time of remembrance, a time of remembering our past sins, a time of repentance, a time of preparation. And God gives us the tools with which to prepare. And the answer is always word and sacrament. <clears throat> no matter how far you may stray from the word, he uses that word to call you back. No matter how far you may stray from his love and your heart become hardened by his sin, his word will crack through that sin give you the healing balm that you need and restore you. He does it all as he comes to you each and every day through his word and sacrament. And that's why we gather together in the Lord's house today and regularly. That's why we regularly gather at his table to receive his forgiving love to be restored, to be strengthened in that word, and to be prepared. So that when he comes again in glory, as we look for that day which is soon to appear, we, his people, may be found faithful, as our God is faithful. That we, his children, may be ready for him to return. 
and that we may be gathered into that glorious messianic banquet, which the table has already been set, and your place card is there. Our liturgy today rehearses that wonderful purpose of that. It doesn't give in to the secular, the superficial, the greed of this world at this time, but it reminds us and rehearses again each and every Sunday for us. His coming, His dying, His rising again, and the promise of His return. This Advent, as we open our hearts again to His Word and prepare to receive Him as He comes at Christmas so long ago and again and again in our lives, let us gather in the Lord's house. Let us gather around His Word in our homes. Let us light our Advent wreaths on our tables and honor Him as He comes. For as he will come one day soon at Christmas, as once he did so long ago, soon he will, one day soon, come again in glory to intervene in our history so lovingly and so faithfully and to take his loving children home to be with him forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for a blessing. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 10 30.